Hello, and welcome to our broadcast about John II Chemnemnus and the Crusader States. I am joined with J. Stephen Roberts from Real Crusades History. So, How's it going? Hello. Thanks so much for having me on. It's a pleasure. Um, big fan of your channel, and uh, great to have you on. So, for those that might not know who you are, um, tell us a little about yourself. Sure. Well, my name is Jay Steven. Um, I run a YouTube channel called Real Crusades History, uh, basically dealing with you know the history of the Crusades, um, other medieval topics, uh, stuff that's closely related to the Crusades. The Byzantine Empire does c come up pretty frequently with our content, um, and that's that's what I do. I also write historical fiction. I did a novel uh, about uh, the reign of Baldwin II of Jerusalem called Why Does the Heathen Rage? And uh, my, my historical fiction is based uh, very closely on uh, the actual history. So it's kind of a, a way of doing a dramatic presentation of some uh, interesting historical stuff. So, um, so yeah, there you go. Hmm. Um, for those who might not know who I am, I'm Daniel Maynard. I've recently graduated with a, a first at King's College London in history and I have a passion for the Byzantine Empire. And um, the Komnemnoi period has always been a specific interest of mine, so. And uh, just fancy doing some history about it, really, and, uh, while I'm here. All right. Well, there we go. Right, should we jump straight in, or? Sure. Right, so. John the Second Chemnemnus was the son of Alexis the First Chemnemnus, who came to the throne in a very troubled time, and so John uh, inherited the empire which he left. But he had a few problems to start off with. First of all, Anna Comnemnine, his eldest sister. Um, conspired against him to try and have her husband, Nikephorus Bryennios, uh, become emperor, and most likely also put her as the center of power behind the throne, and for much of the early part of his reign, in the 1120s, uh, John is spending most of his time in both East and West fighting against the Turks, specifically the Danish men Turks who had recently arisen in the East, as well as the Seljuk Sultanate of Rum, based at Iconium in central Anatolia. And in the West, he also had to deal with the Pechenegs, Hungarians, and Serbs, which were a big issue. To compound all of that, his brother, Isaac, um, also conspired against him. He was given the uh, honorary title of Sebastocrata, which is roughly translates into um, chief, most august, or something like that. It's a title that Alexios I created to make um, which was part of his system. And, uh, and, uh, what was the other thing? Oh, yes. And also in Trebizond, Constantine Gabras rebelled in 1126. So by the 1130s, John has been busy, to say the least. Um, yeah. Any comments? Yeah. Well, um, you know, you and I were talking about who we wanted to focus on, and uh, I, I, John the Second Comnenus has always been uh, one of my favorite Byzantine emperors. Uh, he might yeah. even be my favorite. Uh, which, you know, I suppose he's kind of an easy choice. Uh, he's he's one of the 
the most popular uh, emperors in Byzantine history. Kind of one of those uh, standout monarchs who um, you know can really be pointed to as one of the ideals for a particular state. Uh, I think uh, he's got a couple of interesting titles. Um, he's known. Uh, uh, he was known to the Byzantines themselves as John the Good or John the Beautiful. Uh, his he was, uh, you know, considered to have been of particularly good character. Um, you know, it's kind of interesting. Anna Komnena, who is one of our, uh, well, really our major source for John's father's reign, um, Emperor Alexius. She talks about him very little because she resented him so much. Uh, she was writing her. Uh, her account of her father's reign, uh, probably mostly during uh, during John's reign, and unfortunately, you know, uh, be because of that animosity she had for him, uh, she didn't write about him. Which that would have been great if we could have gotten uh, more source material for John. There's a funny story um, related to that about Alexios. So, mm -hmm. um, in the Alexia had, which is the book Anna wrote. Um, there's a long bit at the end where Anna's um, like brought to the edge of tears thinking about her father. And mm -hmm. in the counter contemporary narrative by a man called Sonaris, um, uh, one thing Anna um, criticizes John for is rather than staying by her father's his father's side until he died, um, as soon as he knows he's dying, he goes straight off to take the throne. Whereas in Zanaris, um Anna and Alexios's wife Irene are basically trying to take Alexios's um, signet ring um, off of his finger as he's dying. Um, so, hmm. yeah, yeah. I mean. Uh... You know, obviously, Anna Kimnena is like a lot of uh, of sources. You have to uh, take her particular biases and perspectives into account. Uh, but yeah, I, I just think uh, you know John the Second. He's he's a really interesting guy, and um, hmm. you know his his early reign. You know, he he again he he is dealing with uh, the issue of the hung the Hungarian campaigns and uh, the Serbs. He's he's quite successful. Uh, on that end, uh, but when, once he does get into the work of dealing with the Turks in Anatolia, he's really quite successful there too. And um, so I think, to, uh, I'm sorry, sorry go ahead. Uh, just to point out, perhaps the most um, successful thing he did in the West was um, at the Battle of Beroria. I, I can't remember, I don't know how to pronounce it, but at that battle, he basically eliminates the Pechenegs, mm -hmm. which are this Turkic horde from uh, the steppes and had repeatedly tried crossing the Danube. And John is the one that after this battle, they're basically never mentioned again because his victory is so complete. Um, okay, yeah, that's that's really interesting. Yeah, I mean, uh, everything about his reign seems to kind of indicate this this empire that is, uh, you know, greatly recovering and, um, you know, really coming back into its own. Uh, I think that, um, you know, he after he he basically secures a lot of the uh, the Anatolian coast, uh, and he doesn't really push into the heart of uh, the, the Turkish power, kind of in the interior of, of Asia Minor. Um, he presses on into Syria. And yes. yeah, I, I kind of, there, there's kind of a couple of ways we can look at that. Um, his Syrian campaign is the one I know the most about just because, uh, you know, it's, it's related to the Crusades and, yeah. you know, dealing with uh, Jocelyn II of Edessa and, and Raymond of Poitiers. Yeah. Um, and that's very interesting. I do think probably it, it for the long-term health of the Byzantine Empire, it almost seems like a, a bit of a lost opportunity because of uh, the military capability that John had if he could have eliminated the Tur Yeah, if, if he could have eliminated the Turkish presence in, um, in Asia Minor, then... You know, that might have uh, 
been better for the long-term health of the Byzantine Empire in general because basically he he really does he he absolutely puts the you know, he he defeats the the Danish men's uh, yeah. in battle I mean, uh, he after eleven thirty four they start breaking apart because one of their um, the Emir uh, Ghazi dies and yeah. uh, then lots of infighting happens. Yeah, absolutely. He's got the Seljuks uh, on the defensive. Um, yes. If if they could, if he could have eliminated that Turkish presence in Asia Minor, Minor entirely, I mean, I think that could have been a decisive moment in history. That would have basically reversed the verdict of of Manzikert. But it's it's kind of intriguing that uh, that doesn't end up happening. Um, you know, one wonders if maybe pressing on into Syria and and kind of pushing the issue at Antioch was maybe a little bit premature of course i think it's it's uh it's hard for us to you know monday morning quarterback when it comes to history because yes you know, these, these things always uh oh if only he did this sort of thing but uh, yeah absolutely i think anybody that, living at the time would have thought wow i mean the turks are really on their last legs here in uh yeah in, in asia minor um you know that that would prove to be uh you know definitely not the case i think it's I think it is important to remember that um, uh, John's empire had fairly recently recovered from pretty much um, 30 years of unmitigated decline. So oh, yeah, I absolutely. think caution does seem to be a very large part of his campaigning um, strategy. Um, it's like... Mm, making the most gains at the least risk because again i'm i'm sure to john um manzikert was a big like the big bad in his mind that you know if i'm not careful i will end up like romanus the fourth and have such and have this catastrophic defeat so which the empire really couldn't afford again um so I think it is important to remember that it's like um, when we do view John's campaigns that, oh, why didn't John just conquer all of Anatolia? Well, he might not have been able to, or at least not initially. Um, I think as well, uh, looking at his campaigns, the, the uh, Turks are always on the offensive. Lots of John's campaigns are a defensive um, strike against a raid and then a counter strike. For, um, for instance, he uh, in, where is it? 11.32, um, John campaigns to retake Castamon, which was the Komnemnoi's ancestral home and then he captures it, returns back to Constantinople. Then the Turks retake Castamon, and then John has to come out again, take back Castamon, and then he goes one step further and takes um, Gangra, which then gets lost in the uh, in a Turkish counteroffensive. So it is a lot of tit for tat back and forth between <clears throat> between the Romans and Turks. Sorry, I think I had my microphone muted there. That's all right. Uh, <laughs> I started to answer you, then I, I realized that my mute was on there. Oh, yeah, why, you know, I, I think that's that's an excellent point. I mean, I, I again, that's kind of the difficulty with... Uh, reassessing uh this stuff and that was always kind of the classical idea especially in earlier times in the modern era was uh that was sort of the one criticism of of john's uh career was that he didn't uh just you know instead of uh just concentrating entirely on asia minor that he went on into syria but that is a really good question i mean how far could he have taken it i mean would he have eventually hit a point where he would have uh you know, dealt with a military disaster in the interior of of Asia Minor. Uh, you know, 
yeah all around i mean his his campaigning there is is certainly impressive and i think that um you know once he actually is in syria and he he launches a couple of campaigns in in syria one in the yeah. or one or two in the 1130s and there's one i think in the 1140s right before he dies but he uh yeah i think that you know the incredible problems that uh that he runs into especially dealing with uh, the crusader states in the north uh the county of edessa and uh the principality of antioch um william of T it's kind of interesting uh and I, I don't know how you want to get into this exactly. Do you want to kind of? Should we should we um start from the top of his? Uh, sure. Like if you wanted to kind of give sort of an overview, and then we could break it so down, we, or if 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 you want me to do that, either way is fine. But I'll do the prelude, and then why don't you do the next bit? So Perfect. the prelude is essentially in eleven thirty-seven to thirty-eight, John with a very large army, conquers all of Cilicia, which is the region just northwest of Antioch. And this, uh, the Armenians there are totally defeated and are pushed into the Taurus Mountains, which he vassalizes and actually captures their ruler, their prince as well. And then he turns his attention to Antioch. Over to you, Stephen. Sure. Um, so basically what happens at this point is he actually puts Antioch to siege. And this is in 1137, I believe. And Raymond of Poitiers at the time was... I believe in, it's 1138. Sorry. Oh, okay. It may have been. But um, at the time, uh, Raymond of Poitiers had to uh, rush back to Antioch very quickly because... He had been involved in uh, some stuff going on in the county of Tripoli. Uh, Zengi, of course, uh, has who's uh, the Turkish ruler of Mosul and Aleppo, who has been causing uh, trouble for the northern crusader states recently, had been besieging a castle. Well, he'd been campaigning in uh, part of uh, the borderlands of the county of Tripoli and ended up uh, focusing his efforts on uh, Montferrat, which was a castle in um in the county of Tripoli and Raymond of Poitiers had to head back to Antioch very quickly because of the arrival of, of John. But, you know, basically John was interested in enforcing the agreement that had been made between, uh, well, I guess we can look at it in two ways. Uh, like, uh, first of all, the agreement that had been made between the crusaders and Deval, I believe it's right. Called. Yeah. I was going to yeah. I was going to say, first of all, you know, there's kind of two phases of that. There's uh, the agreement that was made between the First Crusade leaders when they were actually on the way to yes. the First Crusade with Alexius. And then, um, I, you know, the, the, the treaty that was made in 1103 once uh, Alexius had defeated Bohemond and basically kind of forced him to acknowledge, uh, you know, what he um, had, you know, what to Alexius was this, this breach truce that had happened earlier. And... It's it's a kind of remarkable how long a period of time it was before um, you know that treaty was enforced before you know it's it's the 1130s but again that kind of you know takes us back to all the issues that John had to deal with uh, yeah. prior to this but but yeah it's, it's um, so so uh, and faced with uh, John's overwhelming military power Raymond of Poitiers basically has to do he basically just has to kind of agree to it. Uh, I don't think there's, there's any evidence that he, he wanted to. And William of Tyre, when he describes this incident, kind of makes it sound like, um, you know, there was more of a, a negotiation process that, uh, you know, that Raymond kind of uh, was willing to, you know, grant um, Byzantine uh, uh, overlordship in Antioch at, with certain terms but really it's more just that you know, the emperor yeah. shows up with this massive army and there's you know this this small state that uh raymond of poitiers is uh the lord of can't really you know uh do well, anything to resist that yeah and before before that he there was some there was some other stuff too like he he occupied parts of the the county of edessa as well um raymond uh no uh John had, I believe, or is that his, his uh, campaign not yet. after that? No. Okay, yeah, that may, um, may be the next campaign, but but yeah, um, 
so so yeah uh basically once he's he's kind of put a byzantine garrison in antioch he then proceeds to besiege shizar if i'm correct is that right um kind of uh what he does what so any he, he's in antioch and he gets raymond and uh jocelyn of odessa joins in essentially um and then they go to so the the pact is that raymond will hand over antioch and the rest of the principality as i understand it in exchange for a new principality which right centered around aleppo him. yeah by yeah. conquering aleppo and so they march straight to aleppo this coalition army but um zengi is in aleppo with his army as well as the garrison and as far as i understand it the coalition army isn't large enough to deal with this huge concentration of forces at Aleppo. So they move on to Shizar, which is a easier target. Mm -hmm. And plus it would split the intended target in two. Okay, yeah, and Shizar was um, it's kind of... It's yeah, go ahead. past Aleppo and in between Homs, I believe. Which is where, which is the rough um, boundaries of this new principality that John wants to make for Raymond? Yeah. So it's this this idea of this new principality. It's going to it's it's Aleppo and and yeah, Homs is part of it too, right? Yeah. 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 So this is this is uh, the major power center of uh, the uh, for for the Muslims of of uh, Syria at this time of, of northern syria at this time so this would have been a major game changer if this had actually taken place and so and shizar had for a lot of this time been basically an independent uh, city state basically run by this uh this arab family called the munkadites right and um and yeah it, it would have been an easier target than aleppo but it it still was an incredibly well fortified position yeah and yeah john comes very close to actually capturing it yes um, he takes the the lower town right the lower town it's the uh, citadel that gives him the problems right yeah which shizar is an incredibly difficult nut to crack i mean there's a lot of failed sieges of shizar but uh but yeah william of william of tyre actually blames in part the uh the crusader lords who were uh john's allies so it's, this is coming from a a latin source he says that uh, basically raymond of poitiers and um jocelyn the second of edessa were not uh really giving their full efforts to help uh, uh um john in fact he kind of talks about them uh sort of laying around playing chess or something like that while he's fighting yeah right yeah it's, uh interesting image that yeah and it may be it's probably more of kind of a a way of expressing you know uh uh their lack of interest or uh commitment to what was going on and i think you know in, when we look at the crusader uh establishments and how they react to john's presence uh you know whether it's a uh, folk in jerusalem it's kind of this attitude of uh kind of trying to avoid his his overlordship and you know i guess that might be understandable but um you know if we look at these two particular rulers in fact like raymond raymond of poitiers and uh jocelyn the second of edessa like jocelyn the second was the son of uh jocelyn the first who uh, really was a very impressive military commander yeah um Kind of, kind of part of what's called that pioneering generation of uh, crusaders who had come out and sort of, uh, you know, built this thing up from nothing. Yeah. And Jocelyn II seems to have been the opposite of his father. He was more of a uh, a creature of comfort and luxury. He was not uh, a committed military man. Um, 
uh, I know some of some authors have talked about him, uh, you know, being a little bit too Eastern in his his uh, well Western authors uh, in his his habits. Uh, he he was half Armenian. His mother was uh, yeah. was an Armenian noblewoman. So, and then Raymond of Poitiers, he is. Uh, one of the younger sons of uh, William the Ninth of Aquitaine, which makes him uh, the uncle of Eleanor of Aquitaine, which is kind of interesting. So he comes from uh, sort of that southern French, uh, Gascony, and southern yeah, Rome. culture. You know, there's the whole troubadour thing, and you know, also a very, uh, very much a martial spirit there as well. Yeah. Uh, William of Tyre describes him as being a very capable military man, but uh, his career doesn't really play that, that out. Does it? <laughs> no, it doesn't. Um, he, he. I mean, he may have been the kind of guy who was good in in the tournaments and good at, at you know the tilt and that sort of thing, but in terms of being a a great general, he yeah. was not that. A good and, warrior, but not a good military leader. Perhaps. That's the impression I get uh, from, yeah. you know, but anyway. Uh, well, just before we move on, something I forgot to mention about Raymond and how he turns up. Um, so one of the reasons why John invades Antioch is because in uh, beforehand, he is so... Bohemond, the second of Antioch. Is that right, Bohemond? Um, say that one more time. Bohemond, the second of Antioch, was yes. killed, and he only has a daughter. In this is eleven thirty six, I believe, and uh, he has a daughter called Constance, and John jumps on the opportunity to try and marry her off to his son. Manuel, the uh, later emperor, but this fall f falls through because the crusaders uh, could probably see the writing on the wall and uh, marry her off to Raymond. Yes, that's right. Uh, yeah, Bowman the second, he's killed in battle, um, I, uh, 1130, and and Raymond. Let's see. Yeah, but that is, basically what you're describing is is what happened, and um, uh, I what I don't remember is exactly who it was that orchestrated that uh, that marriage, whether it was the king of Jerusalem or some uh, other power source in the Latin world. But yeah, it basically was kind of a an attempt by the Latins to keep uh, the Byzantine authority out of of the region. But yeah, and William of Tyre actually talks about that, and he sa he says that uh, they wanted to get Raymond of Poitiers in there because if Antioch had fallen back under the control of you know what he calls the effete Greeks, the uh, you know the the Greeks who he describes as you know being not strong and not capable of, of holding oh, yeah. this, the pamphlet all Orientalists. Yeah. yeah, then all, all the blood that the Latins had spent in securing Antioch would have been squandered. But, but yeah, I think that that assessment is probably, you know, in my opinion, probably the best thing for uh, for securing this region would have been to have had a strong Byzantine presence there. You know, especially given the fact that yeah, the current leadership of the Northern Crusader states was was very much lacking. So, yeah, um, it will also give them a big link to an important ally as well. I think, I think the trouble, I think it is the King of Jerusalem that arranges the marriage, but I think the trouble is that the crusade. This is just speculation, but I think the Crusaders didn't want to become the subjects of John. Right, and the yeah. 
and they wanted to maintain their independence. Um, even at the cost of a very um, advantageous um, arrangement, perhaps. But oh, yeah. I mean, I think that's definitely I it. And, and I mean, that's kind of a, uh, a, a reoccurring theme, um, you know, in Byzantine history is yeah. various groups that they are wanting to keep under the empire are kind of resisting that. And so, yeah, I mean, that's, that's definitely what was going on. Uh, it is interesting, though. Um, John's power is one of the things that held Zengi at bay, even without him directly intervening necessarily. Like one of the reasons yeah. that, uh, that Zengi... Yeah, one of the reasons that Zengi raised uh, the siege of Montferrat and allowed uh, you know, the king of Jerusalem to withdraw, you know, basically uh, folk of Jerusalem was, was trapped there, was because uh, this was around the same time that, Z that uh, John was approaching um, in either 1137 or 1138. Yeah. And, and this is a reoccurring theme throughout this period, this kind of mid-12th century period, is that uh, the Byzantine emperor is going to be a figure that puts pressure on the crusaders' most powerful enemies, like first Zengi and then Zengi's son, Nur ad -Din. And, yeah. you know, yeah. Manuel Kemnenis is going to become the overlord of the crusader states, including the kingdom of Jerusalem. You know, we have, uh, we have historical sites and inscriptions uh, from from that period, which, you know, des describe, you know, this, uh, you, you know, the Latin kingdom of Jerusalem, uh, the overlord, you know, Emperor Emmanuel, that kind of thing. And so it's kind of a natural relationship when you think about how, um, you know, remote the crusader states were from the rest of the Latin world and how, uh, you know. Or any Christian power. Exactly, really. yeah. And I mean, mm -hmm. the two I can think of off the top of my head would be, the Byzantines and Georgia, Georgia, yeah, just way in the north. So, yeah, and I mean this ter this territory had been a part of uh, of the Byzantine Empire um, previously, and it's it does seem like yes. a natural relationship, well, especially. Mm -hmm. No, you finish first. Well, I was just going to say, especially given the um, the restoration of the Komnenoi. Yeah, you know, that sort of yeah. restored ability to to intervene in that region. Yeah, well, Antioch itself had been a, a Roman possession until oh, when? Um, it's very, very it's, shortly before the First Crusade. <laughs> yeah, it's. Um, remember I'll look it up real quick. It's, I believe it's Nikephoros the second or John the first that captures it in the 10th century. And then it's only right. after it's in the 1070s that it gets captured by the Turks when I believe it's um, Philaetos Brachamios, who's the Armenian um, warlord. It's basically left to defend for himself. After Manzikert, and it's yeah, it looks like there. 1084 is is when they is when the the Seljuks were able to actually conquer. Yeah, it. so it's like we're talking, you know, very shortly before the well, first I think of, like de facto Byzantine control had gone by that point. Though. Oh, okay. So it was it was um, just the Armenians who were holding it at that point. Yes. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, and. I just want to say I'm, I'm very impressed with your ability to, to pronounce these uh, Byzantine names. Oh, gosh. It, <laughs> it does take a while. I mean, when you have things like Kantakuzanos and Makrim it's like, ugh. Yes, they, they are tough. <laughs> great names. Just, they are great uh, names. Good tongue twisters as well. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, so it's... Um, you know, the, I think there's oftentimes this idea of this foregone conclusion, like, uh, oh, well, you know, the Byzantine Empire was just bound to kind of crumble before before this uh, expansionism of the Turks. But I think especially when we look at this period, we can see how that is not 
the case. I mean, we've yeah. really got um, a long period of time where it could have gone either way very easily. And, you know, it's, it's sort of these, these interesting little moments here, like, uh, you know, John, this, even if we just think about John the second's campaigning in, in Syria and yeah. Anatolia, where things could have happened that could have changed things forever. Like what if John the second had pressed, uh, made the, the conquest of, of Aleppo. yeah yeah if aleppo had been conquered i think that in itself would have been a very interesting development that could have had very serious long the crusader states don't look quite as fragile then right yeah and i think that you know the crusader states as a sort of protectorate of the byzantine empire have a lot more uh mm -hmm. long longevity at that point too because i think you know inevitably that's the direction that uh that that part of the Crusader states, especially, was was headed for, and probably that. I, theme I think conflict between the Crusaders and Byzantines was inev inevitable. Um, well, that brings us on to uh, John's last campaign in um, eleven forty two to forty three. That he was marching his army against Antioch. Okay. Because um, to essentially annex it as far as I'm aware. And um, the Crusaders, as you can imagine, weren't very happy about that. Fortunately, he died. Um, so that never happened. But Yeah, and um, you know, I wonder if uh, that actually would have been a good thing in, in the long term for, uh, you know, just, just if, we're, if we're talking about uh, the longevity of the Principality of Antioch, uh, it, maybe mm. if, if John had had lived longer and uh, had been able to gain control of it. Um, it would have had more of a long term life, but you know, I don't know. It's 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 hard yeah. to say. Yeah. It is interesting though that he dies the same year as the King of Jerusalem, which like Folk dies that year also. Which it's kind of funny because Baldwin the first dies the same year as Alexius. So I don't know what this. Like in 1118. Timing their deaths. All right, I'll die then. And uh, <laughs> yeah. stuff like that happens in history. It's it's kind of like yes. stuff that if you made it up, it would never be believable. But anyway, um, uh, you you had something you were about to say. So I did. Oh, I thought um, you did. But... I did. Um, <laughs> yes. Uh, coming back to a an earlier point you mentioned about restoration and the communion restoration it's really during john's reign that there's a number of encomiasts and panegyrists so um by hold on I can tell you their names uh theodore prodromos wrote a panegyric about john and nikephoros vasaliakis and michael italikos wrote encomia about john which are very praiseworthy um, literature, or designed to be very praiseworthy. And a lot of them, uh, they all mention many times this idea of renovatio, so restoration. And it's like, mm -hmm. but then restoration of what is the real question? And from looking at John's campaigns, um, I'm inclined to think that John II wanted to, at least in his lifetime, restore the prestige of the Roman Empire, which had really taken a beating after man's occurred. And something these campaigns of his really get for him and the empire is this prestige that the romans are back byzantines have got their um bravado again so like when the treaty he gets at shizar because he can't take the citadel and decides to withdraw is he gets an indemnity so money but he also gets a red a cross, right? cross, which was lost 
by Romanus the Fourth at Manzikert. That's right. Which was supposedly created by Constantine the Great. But he brings back this cross, and it's something that um, Nikitas Konyatis, who's the uh, one of the two main Byzantine historians, and I think it's um, uh, mentioned by John Kinemus as well, who's the other one. But mm -hmm. this is like um, it. It's important enough to be mentioned, which I think gives it significance. Whereas they could say, "Oh, John finished Shizar and then went home." So, yeah, I remember um, uh, reading about that, and that is pretty pretty fascinating. And yeah, I think you're you're absolutely right that uh, that was what he was he was thinking. And um, you know, the the Byzantines to me have this kind of interesting, and this this goes back to the Roman idea of just uh, the empire as the legitimate power in the world. And uh, one emperor, one empire. Yeah, and it's like these other little barbar. You know, all every other kingdom is a barbarian kingdom. Uh, yes. you know, whether it's east or west, and uh, yeah, absolutely. I think that um, that that's was the idea here, and uh, there were certain things that never really fully recovered after Manza Kurt. And I know one of the issues that was going on at this time, there were economic problems in the empire that were kind of um, putting pressures there, despite kind of these. Uh, these grandiose, uh, you know, military accomplishments and all that stuff, which, um, you know, might to some extent, I'm not sure, but explain, uh, are you talking you about know, the Pranoia? Uh, explain that to me. Okay. So it was the Pranoia was a system that Alexios the first thought of, which to, um, help deal with a crisis. So Alexios had no money when he became emperor. Right. And so to try and pay for soldiers and staff, he, a Pranoia grant was a, either a land grant or a income grant. So okay, your pranoia is you get all the money from the village of X or a tax exemption. And he handed these out, which meant that you get this grant, you would then have to provide military service. And this is a system that was used throughout this period. But it didn't really have any problems until manual, when these pranoias started to get a bit bigger. Mm. And, uh, and then it really goes off the rails in the late empire, but uh, that's out of our scope for this. Yeah, and I, you'll have to forgive me because I'm, I'm not as, uh, as up on... Uh, the Byzantine aspect of, of that's this, all right, but, that's all right. but yeah, I was, I was thinking too, um, I, if I remember correctly, there was some stuff going on even in Alexius's reign where he was granting trading privileges to certain Italian ah, yes. that kind yeah. of, that some of the, the local merchants thought it was kind of harmful to their business practices or something like that. I mean, you might, um, uh, you, you would be more up on this than me and you might, be able to kind of like expound on on that but I, just, I i remember you know in reading some stuff about this period of, of byzantine history that uh you know uh there were some underlying economic things that kind of uh, threatened the the recovery if you will but yeah maybe so maybe you can kind of expound on that a little bit sure um so in 1082 so to give a little context to this. Alexios I came to the throne in the midst of the Norman invasion of the Eastern Roman Empire. So he had to think quickly. And in 1082, 
he gave the Venetians, who had a strong navy, a trade treaty that, as well as lots of other privileges, meant they didn't have to pay tariffs. Mm -hmm. Which um, my uh, lecturer, Dionysus Staphakopoulos, basically stated that this treaty starts off Venice as, this is the beginning of Venice's rise to being a great power later on. Mm. Because it means they have access to this hugely wealthy empire at no co no extra cost, really. And it, it does help, but later down the line in Manuel's reign, no, and even John's, um, it's a problem. In fact, one of John's first thing he does in 11... Uh, 20... Where is it? Sometime 11, in 1120. One? I'm going to say one. He cancels the trade treaty that Alexios made. Um, which should probably tell you something. Um, mm -hmm. But he then has to reinstate it because the Eastern Roman navies not up to the job of defeating the Venetian one. So he's pretty much forced to reinstate it. So what happens then in um, Manuel's reign is Manuel tries to offset the monopoly Venice has by giving Genoa and Pisa equal treaties, which meant that the Italians can be in competition with themselves. And then finally, um, Manuel just grew a bit fed up with it in the end. And quite famously in 1171, he expels all of the Venetians. He has them all arrested in a day and uh, confiscates all of their property and sends them home. Which, uh, yeah. and then wins the uh, naval war. They try and um, conduct afterwards. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's kind of, uh, you know, the impression I get is that uh, if we look at the Macedonian era, you know, basically prior to Manzikert, uh, the Byzantine Empire had certain internal cohesiveness that maybe was never fully recovered. And that even despite, uh, you know, the uh, the energy and the the pushback that came during the uh, Komnenoi restoration, that there were, you know, certain issues there that maybe prevented it from ever getting to what it once was. Yeah. And, and uh, what, as I understand it, one of the big issues was the loss of Anatolia meant that they didn't ever have access to the military. Um, like that was, that was their main recruiting yeah, ground. For so much, right? Yeah. yeah. And so, and a lot, and a lot of that was, was devastated by, you know, these various Turkish raids and occupations and all that. And so that, probably was a bit because like you're talking about you know alexius has no money alexius is um you know, the armies that the komnenoi raise are more like these mercenary, like mercenaries yeah as opposed to more of these core byzantine armies that existed uh prior to manzikert so yes that's uh very true that are in the beginning of the 11th century, mercenaries do start um, dominating the Eastern Roman military. Oh, okay, I mean, so still, they still have they still have their native troops. So, kind of even before Manzikert is what you're saying, then. Um, yes. Okay. In fact, um, one of the problems Romanus the Fourth had was to do with 
controlling his mercenaries, <coughs> mercenaries, um, which caused some problems. Yeah, it kind of makes uh, me curious about what the composition of John the Second's army when he when he's actually entering Syria. And oh, I can that... I can help you with that. Okay. So native troops, so Anatolians, Balkans, uh, Islanders, so on, native Roman troops, the um, some Latins, um, and Turks, and uh, Cumans, I believe, or uh, Pechenegs, one of the two. So okay, nice. Step peoples, that's... Turks, native troops, and Latins, as well as a few others, probably. So, so that's really interesting. I mean, we have to, you know, wonder what this, the kind of impression that an, an army like this would have made. I mean, uh, you're, you're really looking at this this cross section of some of the major players of this period of time. Hmm. How how many of of his troops do you think? I mean, I mean, roughly would it would have been, you know, Franks, uh, you know, Westerners, basically. West, um, actual Western troops. Um, well, the Varangrian Guard was did have a lot of um, Norsemen. Uh, Russians and Englishmen, the so Anglo-Saxons, which would have been um, the imperial bodyguard. In fact, they uh, one of the big um, turning points in the Battle of Beroria against the Pechenegs, the Varangian Guard. Um, so as them, mm -hmm. there does also appear to be a Latin contingent which was very important in a in um ah. so in 1140 john beg pardon uh john goes on campaign to try and capture the capital of the danish men's in neo caesarea in northern anatolia and he has to fight his way there and one of the battles there, it's Frankish cav a Frankish cavalry charge that breaks the enemy and helps win him uh, the uh, decisive victory, opening up the way to Neo Caesarea. So they were there, and also the Latin troops were one of Manuel Comnenus's supporters when he had to claim the throne. Hmm. So they are there. Yeah. Um, their specific number, I'm afraid, I don't know. But I'm, yeah, I mean, I'm I'm sure. we really can't get specific numbers when it comes to medieval stuff for the most yeah. part. But, but uh, it's kind of interesting to think about uh, these these army compositions, though. Yeah, it must have been a motley crew of like yeah. Turks and Armenians and so on, all in this big blob of an army. Anyway, um, so, so I guess uh, I would be interested to know what some of your overall thoughts are of, of John the second, you know, since uh, you're, you're, you're very deep into Byzantium and I think you have a good uh, understanding of kind of the broader, you know, picture of, of Byzantine history. Do you sort of have an overall assessment of of John's um, of John's career and its place in Byzantine history? I think that, well, on the whole, John was a very successful emperor. Military um, success aside, um, he, under his reign, the economic stability, which had been totally gutted in the previous century was um, on its way back to being um, back to how it had been in the Macedonian era 
um, Nikitas Konyatis does specifically mention that the treasury was full when John died. Mm -hmm. and, uh, for 25 years of near continuous warfare, um, it's pretty good. Um, he also was able to start doing public works again, which um, had died down because of the financial situation. He built the monastery hospital of Christ Pantocrator in Constantinople, which is still there today, I believe. Um, he was... He, he never executed anyone during his reign. Oh, that's interesting. There's something that uh, Coniatus praises him for. Um, and so, one, of, one of our guys in the chat here, Genu, actually mentioned that. He said, uh, you know, don't forget to talk about uh, sort of this, this moral quality to John II. Yes. Um, Mikatas Coniatus does have a large... Um, he writes this conclusion about John, and a large part of it is John's piety, that he kept a very, he had a very moral character. He was a very devoted husband um, to his first wife, um, Hiroshka, later renamed Irene. Um, he was always, he always made sure that his sons, um, were properly dressed and well mannered, and he also he made himself a role model for the rest of the nobility to copy. Um, whether they copied it or not, we don't know, but um, it does inspire. I think it does feed back into this idea of renovatio again. That not only is the empire on its way to restoration, but the emperor is restoring itself. I mean, um, in the pre in the eleventh century, there are all kinds of like palace plots and things like uh, Constantine the Ninth Monomachos, um, who had an affair with the empress, which is why he one of the reasons why he was able to become emperor later on. But when he became emperor. He brought with him his current mistress, um, Sclerina, who uh, the two empresses at the time had to try and accommodate. Um, <clears throat> and so John's reign really, I think it's a moral character. There is also the very particular to the Komnemnoi, especially Alexios I and John, is a renewed promotion of Christianity, as in a real entrenchment and consolidation of Christian orthodoxy in the empire. For instance, um, in Alexios I's reign, he persecutes a group called the Bogomils and basically executes all of those that don't com comply and he tries and gets the clergy to actually go out and start proselytizing in the countryside rather than just staying in Constantinople and I think this renewed Christian zeal that appears in Alexios's reign reflects onto John which is why John has this very moral stance but mm -hmm. I do recommend reading uh, Coniartus's conclusion about John because it's very interesting yeah yeah um, and his have you have you gotten a chance to go to Hagia Sophia yet? It's on my to-do list. Uh, <laughs> yes, um, I need to go to Istanbul at some point. Yeah, there's that really incredible mosaic. Byzantine. 
Byzantinist actually went to Byzantium. Um, yeah, there's, there's <laughs> that really incredible uh, mosaic in Hagia Sophia of uh, John and his wife. And, yes, I've yes. seen the pictures. <laughs> yeah, I, Irene of Hungary. Um, and then mm. I, uh, then Christ is in the middle of them. Yes. Uh, yeah, it's. I have to say, like I, I have gotten a chance to go there, and it those mosaics when you're actually standing in front of them, they're way more dazzling than any of the pictures that that we that we see yes. on on the internet. They are incredible. And when I did get to go to Hagia Sophia and and stand there and look at these, you know medieval mosaics that the byzantines put there it was an incredibly moving experience and um yeah it's and you know it, it, it's uh they are just incredible works of art and yeah. uh the what they're expressing you know kind of this uh you know this this civilization that uh was so powerful and uh potent and uh culturally rich that is uh kind of echoing down to us through those those mosaics it's it's yeah. it's a powerful experience but i think also um yeah. tradition as well is an important thing like you can compare the artistry in john's mosaic with the uh mosaic in ravenna of justinian or the um there's also a mosaic of uh, Christ, John the Baptist, and Mary in the Hagia Sophia, which was made in the reign of Michael the Eighth, about two hundred years after John. So, and it's again very splendid um, mosaics. Oh, I hear. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. This consistency as well, I think, is very so kind of. Is what you're saying that um, you know the the fact that this mosaic of John uh, it, it kind of mirrors maybe some of the earlier splendors of the empire and maybe uh, is a sign of that recovery that we're talking about. Um, I think it definitely plays a part in it. Um, I mean, the, another famous one that you probably saw is the one of Constantine the Ninth and yes. Zoe, which was, which has a funny story about it as well. But um, that was fifth, sixty years before, in a time yeah, when the he, empire he's one of the emperors to decline a bit. Is. Um, yeah, because he's one of the emperors that, that appears in Michael Sellis, I believe, right? Yes, he's the... I think Sellis calls him his favorite emperor, but not, but definitely not the best. Okay. Um, um, yes, and uh, I, I have read Sellis, and Constantine the Ninth does seem a bit of a buffoon, is what, how I describe him. Um, yeah, there's kind of a lot of that in, in Michael Sellis. Yeah. It's also really interesting reading um, Michael Italiates, who's the other historian of the period. Mm, okay. Uh, you can get in English at your local, um, well, maybe not local bookshop, but you can get a copy for a reasonable price. Um, yeah. Again, it's the it does i think the art does show an image of the empire as never changing and staying exactly the same from constantine the great to constantine the 11th but it's mm -hmm. really a false one that the empire is constantly changing and adapting and things like the pranoia system uh john's um type of military campaign the armies the the, so, the society is the society of the 12th century is very different to the society of the 11th century and it's people like alexios and john that help make that 
help made that change because the empire needed to adapt to the, its new circumstances to survive. And you yeah, constantly yeah, see that throughout the uh, life of the empire. Yeah, I know I've heard it described that um, during the Komnenoi period, the empire kind of had to adapt to almost become another monarchy among the other various monarchies of, of you know, Christendom and uh, the East and that sort of thing at that point. Like, uh, I don't want to use the word feudal, but we're almost kind of looking at that. I mean, like, you know, this the system you're talking about is kind of giving out these uh, these almost feudal type privileges. And that's... it. It does have some similarities, but it is very different. For instance, a pranoia was only for life. So when uh, Mr. Pranoia got his grant and died, it went back to the emperor. And the emperor could always take it away. Yeah. I think that is a fundamental thing about the Byzantine Empire, Empire that is very different to Western feudal societies that the emperor can at any time give and take away. Whereas in Western society, that's not quite the case. Yeah, that's not possible at all. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, and I, and I cut sort of if as we're rounding off things with, yeah. uh, you know, the the that was a quite in, long digression. Oh no! I mean, we had a couple of digressions. It's a, it's a casual yeah. <laughs> thing. These, these live yeah. streams are casual, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I kind of think um, you know this encounter between uh, the Northern Crusader states and uh, and John the Second. It's kind of these two different worlds uh, clashing to some extent. I mean, you know, for the the Byzantines, everything is the empire and. I mean, well, I think, you know, as we're talking about them adapting it to some extent, that's, that's changing too, you know, that there are these protectorates and that sort of thing. But mm. uh, this idea that everything has to be um, the empire uh, and whereas for, you know, we look at what the Crusaders did when they show up, uh, they kind of create these new entities. And it's not like, you know, Raymond of Toulouse, who's one of the most, you know, uh, powerful men in the West, he doesn't say, okay, well, now this is part of the county of Toulouse. He says, well, no, this is this new thing, the the county of Tripoli. Yeah. So it's kind of like... Uh, um, I mean, a know, concept like that was foreign uh, to the Romans, really. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if, you, if you were to look at every usurpation, like civil war, rebellion, by and large, all of them are directed at replacing the emperor. There's never like a, I'm going to rebel and try and create a kingdom of Greece. Um, mm -hmm. Not, and that idea never really occurs until... Um, Cyprus, maybe? And Yeah, until... The, the empire of Cyprus? Um, right at the end of the 12th century, where things start to fall apart with yeah. Andronicus, uh, Isaac and the Angeloi, and the Fourth Crusade. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, uh, Constantinople was the center of everything. And, uh, you know, the emperors, uh, yeah, I mean, the, they didn't want to. Like I think that that was one of the the issues I think for Alexius was uh you know can could he go off and do this like extended campaign in Syria uh, um, there was this certain need to be close to uh, the heart of the empire you know it's it's uh... John I'm sorry John I was thinking of, I was thinking of Alexius like uh, oh you know, yes during the first well, crusade yeah. during the first crusade the first crusaders wanted Alexius to go. Uh, with them, you know, yes. but uh, for, for the for the emperor at that time, that was something that was uh, maybe impossible I, I, to to engage in the kind of campaign they were they were wanting him to engage in. 
just because well, there's this need to be close to, to Constantinople. And uh, I know that when Antioch was besieged uh, by the Turks, um, Alexios was on his way with an army. Yeah. But before that, um, it is his generals, his his uh, family that are going out and doing things for him. He himself is on campaign quite a lot, especially in the 1080s when oh, yeah. he's in the field fighting um, Robert Giscard. But, yeah. but he, does re he does return to Constantinople fairly frequently, though, doesn't he? Yes. In like fact, that's... John's away from Constantinople. Oh, that is quite interesting about John. Pretty much every campaign he fights is with him at the head of an army. Unlike um, in previous, like unlike the reign of his father, when um, you could have um, commanders like Isaac the Sebastocrator um, or someone else go out. Well, yeah, I think John was was away from the capital far far more than his his father was. Yeah. So. And, uh, so it, it, I think John II's reign is very unique in many ways. Um, yeah. Full stop. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. With that. Should we come to his military success? Since that, sure. I think that is, from what I've read that does seem to be a point of controversy which is always good fun um so stephen john the second military success question mark well i mean is is the fact that he was a successful you know he conducted many successful campaigns i mean i think you know clearly he did uh, i guess the controversy is more like um, what what was ultimately accomplished. I think, especially if we look at the stuff in uh, in the Crusader states. I mean, yeah. it's it's kind of like he 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 shows up and he makes a big impression, but is there any real long term consequence to what he's doing in in northern Syria? I mean, yeah, he kind of. Uh, you know, it's like he wants control of of uh, Antioch. He, you know, but is it really possible to create the kind of military establishment there that would be necessary for this sort of long term uh, Byzantine yeah. presence there? Because that doesn't, quite that doesn't really happen from the rest of the empire at this point as well. Right, have to it go is. along this long strait in southern Anatolia, which could, which was raided um, by the Turks. So, yeah, which I guess that kind of brings up again the issue of uh, should he have pushed all the way into Syria? I mean, should it have been just a total, you know, focus on on Anatolia? Mm -hmm. But. I think it's I interesting know. that he does try and start with a diplomatic um, way of trying to make Antioch one of his spheres of influence, that, mm -hmm. which plays very much into the way the Romans did things, that um, diplomacy is very much a weapon of war, just as much as the armies are. Um, I think he he is very success. Although there's not much tangible success, as in there is no principality for Raymond. There is a brewing conflict with the Crusaders at the end of his life. He there's no major conquests in Anatolia, but he is able to defeat the Turks pretty much every time he pretty much every time there's no major defeats against them 
and that that does show you something that although his victories are small and maybe inconsequential in the long term they are all victories there's never a big catastrophe like um like what happened to his son Manuel at Myrokephalon, where um, Manuel's army, which was out to try and annex Anatolia, was completely destroyed. <coughs> Sorry about that. Oh, yes. Sorry, I think I missed some part of your... Uh... Your, what you were saying just there because I seem to have had a connection thing but That's yeah I, th I I guess you know probably what was really needed after uh, after Manuel was another was a fourth emperor in the Komnenoi restoration to kind of continue that process of yeah um and yeah, you know, that that's one of the issues with the Byzantine Byzantine Empire too is that it's it was so dependent on a yeah. capable emperor, you know, yes. I th it's kind of interesting. It's in some Latin institutions, you know, you could have, you could maybe have a king uh, be in captivity or something or uh, be absent for, for a period of time and things could kind of keep humming along just because of the nature of the institutions. But Byzantium really needed that yes. really they, capable they emperor. They have a really poor uh, record with uh, boy emperors. Most of them end up dead. Or uh, yes. <laughs> like Alexios II, who was um, Manuel's son. Mm -hmm. And yeah. he was Manuel's only male heir. And uh, Manuel, uh, sorry, Alexios's mother, Maria of Antioch, who was the daughter of Raymond of Poitiers. Um, she and her lover were regents, and they were completely useless, which didn't help. And so Andronicus, who was Manuel's cousin, comes onto the scene, murders all of them. And uh, a couple of years later, because he was a bloodthirsty tyrant, you then have the Angeloi come onto the scene which were some of the worst emperors ever. So mm -hmm. I think you're completely right that it, it, in fact, you didn't even need to have a, like a, a John or a Manuel. You just needed someone who was half competent to uh, take the reins of the empire. And um, Byzantines didn't really get that break. Yeah. yeah, that's kind of the way I've I understand it, and it's you know I, I'm far less versed in uh, the Byzantine thing than you are, but that's always been my my impression. So, mm. <laughs> but yeah, it's um, it's it's great history, and it's it's yeah. uh, you know, just in terms of Byzantine literature, I mean, you know, we were talking about Michael Sellis earlier. I mean, Michael Sellis is one of the most powerful medieval writers I've ever read. Yes, it, it's, it's so... Just it's in terms like, of human interest. It, yeah, it's like, he, it's like he's next to you and telling you what's going on as yes. it happens. I mean, there's... Uh, when I read it, there was a really memorable part when um, he's describing the use of the um, coup against a man called Michael V. And he's an eyewitness in the fact that he was there as it was happening in Constantinople. And you can just imagine the sort of if you were to place yourself there, you could have the same image of what's going on as it happens. And as the book goes on, Salus becomes more and more an integral part of the story. 
Yeah. Fact, um, coming back to a Comnemnus, Isaac the first, um, who became emperor after um, a civil war with Michael the sixth, uh, nicknamed the Old. Um, he was the ambassador that Michael the sixth sent to Isaac during the civil war. And it's pretty much definite that Michael Sellus engineered the succession of Constantine the Tenth when Isaac Comnemnus became very ill. So there's there's a lot there that yeah. I think you don't get in something like um, a chronicle written much later, where it's like. This happened, this happened, and this happened. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of, uh, you know, medieval writing can be kind of laconic and, uh, uh, you know, Im impersonal. I mean, when it is more personal, it's, it's really fascinating because, you know, there are some chronicles that, that are more uh, personal in that way. But, um, but yeah, Celis has always been one of my favorites. Um, I don't think... Anna Kamnena's stuff is as gripping, but I, but her book has always been one of my favorites. And then um, there's another uh, John Skelitzi's. Uh, I remember yes. after I read Celis, I picked that up, which that's massive, and I read the, that a couple uh, times. Translation by John Walden. Uh, I don't remember what translation I hmm. have, but it's it, but it's yeah, it's incredible stuff. I mean, yeah. I, the Byzantines because of their high literary culture. A lot of their their writing is just really fascinating to read. It's very well, it's inherited from the Roman historiographical yes. traditions, mm -hmm. um, like um, which is very long and very uh, entrenched. And yes, there's they're always referring to things as well, which is quite interesting. Yeah, a lot of classical references. Yes. Well, anyway, I probably am going to need to to get going at this point, but yeah. this is this has been a lot of fun. I'm glad we yes. got to, it, to do it's this. It's been uh, a pleasure talking to you, Stephen. And, uh, and same to you. Yeah. Well, I think I think we've done John the Second some justice in uh, what we've been talking about, and. Uh, any concluding remarks? No, I, I think we've uh, we've gone over it pretty well. I mean, you know, the way I've always thought of it is, um, I've always admired John the Second as a leader, and I have never admired Jocelyn the Second or Raymond of Poitiers as leaders. And so yeah. it just always seemed to me like, you know, it's too bad um, he couldn't have done more to uh, maybe. <laughs> bully them and overtake them. I don't know. <laughs> I think uh, sometimes that if only I could tell Jocelyn that, hey, mate, uh, why don't you jo help John out? You'll lose Odessa in a few years. Um, yeah. Could help. <laughs> or uh, Raymond, stop being an idiot. Yeah, because I mean, uh, conceivably, what, what what's really going to happen? He's going to hang around for a while and uh, you're going to pay him homage and then he's going to go back only, you know, now you won't be. I mean, you might have a under... Greek patri patriarch in Antioch. Right. And, maybe and you know, that's kind of, of interesting. Official. That's probably about it. That's kind of interesting. Um, I think one of the big sources too of the resistance came from the Latin clergy in Antioch. But, yes. but you know, and that's, that's one issue uh, with the principality of Antioch has always been that. It's part the of Latin the Pentarchy. Yeah, and the Latin clergy were were very hostile towards the Eastern clergy, which was not really the case in uh, Jerusalem, because the kings of Jerusalem, like Baldwin I, early on established this principle that uh, you know the various Eastern rites could have access to the holy sites, uh, you know, uh, for their traditions, and um, so there was just like a, a lot. There's more bad blood, I think, in the Principality yeah. of Antioch. I think and, uh, Byzantines were far more aggressively pushing for a, a uh, 
Greek patriarch in Antioch. Than in oh, oh, yeah. Well, no question. I mean, they, they were pushing for one in Antioch, and they really weren't pushing for one in in the South. Yeah. So, so I guess that that's my those are my concluding remarks. I guess. Yeah, I think that. Um, for my conclusion, um, for the two Byzantine authors that talk about John, that although both of them are talking about a man or an emperor who lived before they were even born, both of them were born in the reign of Manuel, um, both of them and... I know Nicetas Comnenus calls John Comnenus the greatest of the Comnenoi. And I think to leave, although he did live through all of the uh, Angeloi and Fourth Crusade stuff, I think that for an impression of someone, for someone to leave an impression on someone like Nicetas, um, does say something about him that rather than saying like oh John was alright but Alexis was better or Manuel wasn't too bad but it's a very certain thing that John II was a great emperor should be numbered amongst the great emperors of, emperors of old and the em greatest emperor we've had since um, his death really tells you something about the quality of ruler and person he was. Yeah, I think that's an excellent point. Yeah. All right. All right. I think we're ready to finish. Um, as I say, it's been a pleasure having you, Stephen. And same to you, my friend. Yeah. And for all those watching and will watch uh leave a comment and i'm sure uh i'll answer them so uh i hope to see you all on the next one Thanks. all right daniel